Hello and welcome to Beauties and the Beasts. I'm Will Presti and I'm here on Madison Avenue in New York City where advertising as we know it was born. Now in 1967, a colorful character named Jerry Delafamina started his very first agency and it quickly became the stuff of legend. Between its massive success and wild party atmosphere, complete with excessive alcohol consumption and even sex contests, it's no wonder it was the inspiration for the hit TV show Mad Men. Join me as I sit down in the Hamptons home of Mr. Della Femina himself, where he gives us an unprecedented look into his remarkable life story. How did he go from Coney Island born delivery boy to Madison Avenue icon? Why did his female employees hang photos of their bare breasts in the company men's room? And just how did he get that famous Meow Mix cat to sing? You don't want to miss this one. Jerry Della Femina, the original madman. Let's go. Taxi! Well, I'm sitting here with the world famous Jerry Della Femina. Jerry, thank you so much for coming on, being Great our guest. Pleasure. Great You're pleasure. our first guest, by the way. Very excited about now that. Now I'm nervous. Now you're nervous. <laughs> now we're, we're starting at the top, the very top of the mountain. I don't know where we're going to go from here, but we had to start with you. Thanks Good so much be for here. being here. Um, obviously, first thing I got to ask you about whenever people hear the words Jerry Della Femina, especially my generation, any generation really, it's so synonymous with Mad Men, with that show. It's always right there. They say you were the inspiration for it. Did you, first of all, did you coin the term Mad Men? No, they picked it up. The fact is that they picked up a lot of, from my book. I wrote a book about advertising called From Those Wonderful Folks Who Brought You Pearl Harbor. Right. Uh, and and uh, there was a lot of wildness in that book, and they picked it up as the sense of it. And it was a wild time. It was the 60s and the 70s, and it was incredible. Yeah. Now, the show... Well, Mad, Mad Men, of course, a lot of people, I remember when I first found out, it actually stands for Madison Avenue right. Men, people right. think. So it's, you know, and then the, so the book was obviously instrumental in Mad Men, the TV show, the right. AMC show. You're said to be the inspiration for that. Is that very clear to you? I mean, have they ever reached, are you Don Draper? Have they reached out to you? Or you what? I look like Don Draper. You, that's why I'm I asking. I know that part. That's why they, that, that's why, how they found me. Uh, the fact is that uh, I, I did a lot of, work at the beginning with them helping that helping it turn into a show so they uh, did bring you on to sort of give them the to, ins and outs just to promote it i promoted it okay. you know, in, in different ways but it was it, the show was absolutely exactly what it was it was so true yeah it was that time crazy fun exciting uh whatever happened to me <laughs> I think you're, I mean, you're fun and exciting. I can't say if you're crazy or not. We'll see by the end of the interview. Um, but so, so in the preface of your book, you say that what you guys did in reality made the show Mad Men look like, and I want to get the wording right here, Rebecca from Sunnybrook Farm. Now that's a reference, thank you. I had to go look up. That's a, a book. It was a Shirley Temple movie. Yes. So the, it was even wilder in real life it than was the wilder. show depicted. It, it was much wilder. How so? Let's get into it. Let's let's get. We into had it. Uh, the agency sex contest. Agency sex contest. I, I figured out that people were spending too much time lusting after each other. So why don't we just do it on one day, and then get back to work? <laughs> so I started, which lasted about sixteen years. The agency sex contest, in which everybody voted right. for the person that person that they most wanted to go to bed with. Secret vote. And then everybody, would, we would go to a, a Mexican restaurant. We'd pay them to close their doors. Everybody would be drunk and stoned, and I would announce the winners. And the, top, the, the, the couple that won, that didn't mean that they voted for each other. It just meant that most, most women wanted to sleep with this guy. Most men wanted to sleep with this woman. They got a weekend at the Plaza Hotel for themselves. Uh, and then we had different categories. We had the gay category. Right. Uh, and then there was advertising. They, they actually, since we were an advertising agency, people started to advertise to try to win it. And it was amazing. There were, there were ads up, put up, everybody. You know, one woman actually Xeroxed her breasts. Uh, her bare breasts. Yes. And there they were on, on us. On our, and what was so wild about it is, you know, the, the, the office was plastered with these ads. I mean, there were ads for everybody. And, and uh, one day we had a client who came in by surprise. Right. Uh, it, was, it was Utica Club Beer. It was a beer company. And the guy came in and I said, my God, we cleaned up the place before he got there. And he sits down 
And then he has to go to the men's room. And as he gets up, I remembered we hadn't covered the men's room. <laughs> and what, what happened is the women would come in into the men's room and put up their own posters. Oh, my God. So there was a guy who actually was standing near a urinal with a picture of an account, a woman account executive saying, can I help you with that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did, he, did he take a little longer in the bathroom than he originally had planned? Did he come back very mellow and kind of cal calm down? He came back shocked. He, he came, came back, back shocked. He was twitching. He didn't say a word. He was twitching. I he think he might twitching. have been twitching in the bathroom, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Now, and, and so that, that was the wildness of it. And, 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 you know, we felt that we could win and do anything and try anything. And, you know, it was before being politically correct. Right. But everybody was doing it. It was fun for everybody. A lot of laughter. A lot of fun for everybody. A lot of fun for everybody. Everybody, you know, everybody was, and we felt like we could do anything. Yeah. And, and or was, anyone. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> As it turns out. And, and it, you know, let's face it, there were a lot of romances. A lot of, you know, marriages were broken. Uh, lives were changed. Right. But the fact is, there's some people who are still, literally still married and happily married. Yeah. Who met at the agency. And it was it was really to get people to feel that they could win and they could do anything they wanted. And we were just wild. We were just wild. We know there was, I had a, a bar in, in the, in, in my office and basically it was, it was there all day. So people came in all day and poured themselves drinks. Right. And I, some people came in in the morning and I, I, I'd say, you know, what are you doing there? Oh, my father was a baker and he always came home and had a shot before he went to sleep. So I came. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. So, okay. So the plaza, you give him a night at the plaza. No, no, no. Did these, did, I mean, do you know if if this hottest guy and hottest girl, I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Did they consummate this this championship? One couple only. One, in, out of 16 years? Yeah, out of 16 years, one couple only for sure. One couple admitted. No, I think that, they, you know, it was one couple for sure. I'm not going to ask you if it was you, because no, I know I, you're a happily no, no. married man. I, never me. You know, it was like a sophomoric. Sure. It was like being in, in, you know, I never got to go to college and, you know, belong to a fraternity. This was the fraternity antics. This was crazy yeah. stuff. But everybody, and I'm very proud of this. We have a, a group on Facebook. Right. There's about 270 people who, they call themselves Jerry's Kids. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not literally. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but they all say, this was the best job they ever had in their lives. That's awesome. And that's great because, you know, you could run a place and you could do a lot of things, but to have people feel that they had the best, and we turned out great work. Well, that's what I was going to ask you was when it, I mean, first of all, it sounds like HBO really missed the mark or Showtime. They should have grabbed the rights to the show, not AMC, because right. there was a lot of X-rated stuff going on. But do you think it's conducive to creativity? Do you think it's something about, like, what was it? Because... As far as I can tell, the 50s and the 60s were a pretty, you know, socially conservative time until the, the liberation came a little bit later in the 60s. You picture people with all these moral standards right. and, and white picket fence. And then here you guys are at the office doing these kinds of things. Is this something about marketing in particular or advertising in particular? Or do I just not want to ask my grandparents what they were doing in the office in the 50s and 60s, right? I, I think it, it, it really works for advertising. It doesn't work, it didn't work for other, other businesses. I, I, if our clients found out, I think they would fire us. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just think it worked for us because advertising should be, you know, there's a great line in, in a, 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 me and Bobby McGee, uh, written by Chris Christopherson, uh, and the word is, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Hmm. And wow. we had nothing left to lose. Yeah. We didn't care. Uh, and we kept picking up business, and we kept winning awards, and we kept doing these campaigns, and we kept selling stuff. Yeah. I mean, people were buying Blue Nun wine. They were buying Beck's beer. They're, we were really good at what we were doing. Right. Uh, and a lot of it was because we just felt we were, we were winning. Yeah. And that's, that's really great. And they also felt that they were part of something. The secret was the fun of it for them. Nobody should know at other agencies the fun we're having. It sounds like Wolf of Wall Street stuff. I mean, it almost yeah, makes yeah. me sad. I mean, but there were, I mean, you're talking, mean, I know in your book you talk about how a lot of the people from then, it's poetic, but it's tragic, died from the things that they were pushing, whether it was selling alcohol, selling Cigarette. cigarettes, Cigarette. things sure, like that. Sure. But drugs and alcohol, these, this was also a part of it. Substance, you guys were doing that at the office as well? 
Well, no one, no one was smoking grass in the office. Not in the office, okay. But when we had our our party, there was a lot of grass. You know, there were, you know, I don't think many people got you know visibly drunk. Right. But people like to have it. Talk about drinking. Five of us would go to a restaurant called the Italian Pavilion, which is now Michael's on on, on Fifth Avenue, off just off of Fifth Avenue. And as we walked in, we would have the guy, the, the bartender, would be shaking a martini. And then after uh, we had one martini, we started looking at the menu, and another martini would arrive. Five of us would drink. And then when the food was just about to arrive, a third martini would arrive. So each of us had three martinis. Then right. someone would say, all right, let's get some wine. So we had wine with lunch. And then invariably, I was never one of them, but invariably someone said, instead of dessert, I think I'm going to have a scotch. And then we went back to work. <laughs> this was middle of the day. Middle of the day. This was. I'm thinking this is like, you know, no, no, Friday no. night happy this hour. Is, this is from 12.30 until 2.30. How was productivity after that, though? I mean, it's got, you know, did uh, it hinder, or were you thinking some great things at this point? Uh, I, I think it probably hindered a little mm. bit, but it, it, it was, we had fun, and we were drinking, and we were talking, and now, if, you, if I have one martini, they have to come and, and carry me out. I mean, <laughs> but in those days, it was, it was a drinking group, it was a, a, a hard-playing group, right. and it was a fun group. And it's like people have to feel like they're part of a team. Sure. And they're part of something that's really going to win. And It obviously worked, right? It worked. It worked. It worked for us. I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't change a thing about that. You know, today, you couldn't do anything close to that. Today, no. you know, you, 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 can't, you do not even say hello. You know, you don't say, gee, I, that's a very nice dress you're wearing. Right. You say nothing. Let alone meet me in room 419 yeah, in the yeah, plaza exactly, hotel. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that, today it's a different world. Wow. And no one says it and no one, you know. Boring or the way it should be or the uh, way it shouldn't be? What, it's what do you the think? way it should be today. Okay, that's it's fair. Not the, you know, the fact is that, you know, anybody who tries to live that way today is really off. <laughs> and that was, way. are you saying that was mostly your agency or was this a widespread thing amongst other agencies? Not the sex contest, but in general, the whole culture. In general, it was mostly my agency. Okay. A lot of other agencies, you know, the head guy, the boss, well, acted like he was the boss. Right. I, I, I never felt like I was their boss. Hmm. And I felt very comfortable with them. They felt comfortable with me. And also, I was in their writing. I was doing the same thing. So we were creating. My partner and I, Ron Travisano, and I created. And, you know, we, we did, you know, uh, one of my favorites was uh, we did a, a commercial for uh, Ralston Purina. Mm. And there was a, a uh, cat trying to swallow some cat food and choking. And when we got back and we're looking at the, the footage, my partner said, you know, if you put music to that, it'll almost look like that cat singing. Well, we put music to it. And that was the famous singing cat. Uh, meow, me. meow, 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 Absolutely. Meow. Every little kid grew up with saying, you know, those, before they said their first words, they said, meow, 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 meow. <laughs> and it's still running, actually. People yeah. Still see, yeah. So that was part of that fun, that we could look at things in a different way and see things, you know, and, and have fun with it. That became the, the highest scoring commercial after our recall right. of any commercial ever done. People wow. just loved it. And, and it, was, it was an accident. And an then accident. the client said, well, can you do it again? We said, no, we don't do accidents on purpose. Wait, so you're telling me that that cat wasn't actually singing in that commercial? I am blown away. I, know, I thought I, you I, found break, a singing cat. This may be break, breaking your heart. It's isn't? breaking my heart. <laughs> I wanted to know where that cat is. No, that, I always told people that, you know, the cat was choking and we had to do the hunt. Cat Heimlich maneuver is tough because you get scratches on your arms. <laughs> uh, well, I read that a woman actually, a, you had a singer actually sing the meow, 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 oh. right? Great story about that because the woman who sang that, we had somebody else scheduled to come in and sing. She didn't show up. Right. So now we're at a recording studio mm -hmm. and somebody came by and we said we knew her from other stuff. She said, "Can you sing?" So she sang it. She put two kids through college off for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good for somebody. She That's sang great. The, the singing cat song. See, when I, I mean, I'm a millennial, and when I hear Meow Mix, the first thing I think of, I don't know if you're aware, there's a plug for Meow Mix in Austin Powers. 
Do you know no, about no, that? No, There's a great little scene out of nowhere <laughs> where Mike Myers as Dr. Evil is just in his evil lair. Oh, great. And his cat is there, Mr. Bigglesworth, and he goes, Din Din, I want chicken. I want liver. <laughs> meow mix, meow mix, please deliver. And that is That's the first wonderful. thing I think That's of wonderful. with uh, with meow mix. And they, you know, we were selling a lot of stuff. We were, we were actually working in a way that we were winning. Yeah. And that's the fun, you know. I was I was in the middle of it. You know. For me, it was great because I, I you know I loved to write. I, I you know I, I was basically a messenger, and uh, well, you know when I was still in high school, and uh, I saw this guy with his feet up on the desk. I was at an advertising agency, and I said, "What's that guy do?" And he said, "Oh, he's he's a copywriter." Right. I said, "Wow." He said, "He makes twenty five thousand dollars a year." I said, Twenty-five thousand dollars a year. That's all the money in the world. I want to be a copywriter. Right. So I started looking for seven years, and couldn't find a job. But I stayed with it, and uh, I, I had a million other jobs. You know, I, I had uh, by that time I had a wife, and two kids, and I was just you know I was selling uh, bathrobes and gimbals and <laughs> gimbals, uh, wow. and toys and Macy's and uh, yeah. and. Um, I got my first job, and I love to write. And now I write a column every week. Perfect. Yeah, you got it. The column up here. Uh, it first appeared in the Independent, which was a newspaper I owned. One of the last columns was when when you, the last of your three gods dies. Hmm. And my first god was Jimmy Cannon, a reporter for the New York Post, and I learned how to write from him. Hmm. And my second god was Jimmy Breslin, who was a sports reporter sure. and a wonderful writer. I learned about style from him. And my third god just recently died was Peter Hamill. And I learned really about life from yeah. him. And so I could, you know, and I love it, and I write it, and it's, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's serious. Yeah. Uh, has a very interesting, you know, audience. They, they, they like it and like it a lot. Well, you can tell why you're so successful, because it's, you can tell when you're talking about it, it's in, it's in your blood, it's, yeah. it's who you are. Yeah. Um, and I know you broke in, like you said, it was what, I think in your book, 19... Uh, 52, right? You were 16 years old. You were yeah, doing yeah. Uh, deliveries and right. you wanted to be in this world. Was it heartbreaking in as an Italian American? I mean, was there kind of a stigma, right? There was kind of more waspy uh, agencies and a couple of Jewish agencies. Did you ever find that kind of discriminatory? Uh, no, because it was accepted that if I was Italian, I had to be an art director. I could be a writer. Okay, well, that's discrimination. You had to be an art. Is that what you wanted at the time, or no? I mean, you wanted to be a writer. Uh, no, I wanted to be a writer, and I had tough. You know, I didn't have enough much of an education. Right. So I didn't have anything to back me up, and I just kept looking and looking. And uh, I was married before, and my wife's uh, uh, aunt would always say, "Take the sanitation. You could be a garbage man." <laughs> And make a lot of money as a garbage man. I said, I don't want to be a garbage man. It makes, the smell makes me sick. I just want right, to write. Right. And I, I stayed with it. Yeah. And I stayed with it, and I stayed with it, and I got my first job. Well, what, what was your big break? I mean, what, what, what was the point, and did you realize it then? What was the point when you went from trying to make it to becoming someone that I now am, am honored to be interviewing? Yeah. You know, Was there a moment? Uh, I think it, when I got my first job, when I first realized that I could do it. Yeah. You know, I kept, you know, you spent seven years telling people, I can do it, I can do it. And then you get a job, you have to really do it. <laughs> and I was, I was really uh, uh, not surprised. I always knew I could do it, but suddenly I'm writing ads. Right. And you know, they're, they're in papers and they see it. People like it. And I did my very first ad was for a moving company. And it was a tiny ad, the New Yorker, and it just said, oops, we haven't used that word in the last 35 years. <laughs> And uh, the ad won an award, my very first ad. So I was, and, and for me, it's always been nothing but fun. It yeah. really has been fun. I can do it, and I'd love to do it. And uh, I, I, it's treated me very well. You know, when we started the agency, we were, we were broke. Mm. I mean, broke, broke. I, I threw a party to, well, it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we were, about, we were about to go out of business. And... Um, my partner, we were down to our last $6,000 or whatever it was. And he, my partner said, what are we going to do? And I said, I know, let's do a party. He said, what, are you crazy? I said, no, let's look successful. Wow. <laughs> so we took a restaurant called L'Etoile, I remember, forget that. Spent the $6,000 on that restaurant, invited everybody from advertising into the, 
into that party and, and looked like we were successful. At one point, my partner said to me, don't eat that, we may need it for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it, and we looked successful, and we got three accounts out of that party. Wow. And then we were, we were running. Yeah. Did doubt ever creep in, or was it always a confidence? Did you have to kind of lie to yourself, fake it till you make it, or were there moments where you're saying, I can't come up with the... Like, let's talk a little bit about ideas, yeah. right? How does, it, how does it go from here to here to here, right? Fast. Very fast. fast. Yeah, I, I really never really doubted myself. And I would sit down with my partner, and, and as he used to say, you know, you're, you're like a popcorn machine. You have all these ideas. <laughs> and, and also, as a writer, you always have to be willing to, strange word, put your heart out there. Hmm. You have to be well. It's test time every day. Right. Somebody reads it, and, you know, they, they like it or they don't sure. like it. Sure. You come from a family of, of immigrants, yeah. and, and you're from New York, and so many books that I read from successful people of your generation were immigrants in the New York area. Was there something about just kind of being rough and tough or having to survive or something where you just learned how to, how to, how to make it in life? Uh, street is an overused word, but you become street. You yeah. start to fo- you know, you follow that. You know, I grew up in an area which was... 100% Italian. I couldn't speak English when I went to school. I uh, brought up by my grandparents who spoke Italian. My parents came home from work. They spoke Italian. Yeah. First day in school, teacher said, good morning, children. 34 kids said, good morning. I said, buongiorno. But I, I had to learn how to speak English. Wow. But, you know, I, 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 I read a lot. Uh, but the fact is that, for me, uh, the street was the best place. I yeah. learned from these people. You know, someone asked me, who do you write to when you write? I said, I write to my mother. You start to write for real people yeah. instead of uh, for the world. And you reach people. You reach. Sure. So for me, it's, o- it's always been easy. It's been really easy. You talk about how the industry kind of evolved in the 60s. I think um, you said uh, with Doyle Dane and, and Burnback, you said was doing some revolutionary things. Great and work. then. The creative revolution you mentioned, I think, what, 1961 or so? 61 to how about, did, uh, yeah. yeah. How did it yeah. change? I mean, what it went from what to what? Well, to begin with, advertising was a very waspy business mm-hmm. for a lot of years. And the first real Jewish agency that came in was Doyle Dane Burnback and Gray Advertising. Gray changed their name. They didn't call themselves their real name, which was uh, Rosenthal. Uh, they called themselves gray. They named themselves after the, wall, the color on the walls. Right. Try to get become a, a WASPY agency. Uh, and, and the fact is that, that people at that time, you know, were very staid, and advertising was a very cold business. Very, you know, it was, wasn't much fun. Right. But they had it made. They sold a lot of cigarettes. They sold a lot of alcohol. And they were special and different. In comes the first Jewish agency, and there's a little bit of humor added to it. They do ads for Volkswagen, and suddenly you see a car ad that makes you smile. You know? Is that Think Small? Think Small. Yeah. It was the very first ad that they did. Right. And suddenly they, they, they do wonderful advertising. Wonderful to me. People I knew at that time, people were saying, oh, you don't want to be like that Doyle Dane agency. <laughs> because they were, they, they were laughed at because they were not, uh, you know, the standard old boring agency. Well, they, they opened it for all of us. Yeah. I mean, Bill Burnback opened it for me and a million other it- Italians and Jews. And we be- then became the creative people. We were the creatives, you know, don't, don't. And people still left us. We were like monkeys, you know. <laughs> Look at the, the, the creatives. Show it to the creatives. Ha ha ha. Advertising, you know, right now advertising's changed so dramatically that, you know, there's. It's not the same. It's a different world. Well, you talk about that, how you say, I think you say in your book, a couple of college kids in, in a day with some tech on their computer could do what used to take you guys weeks to do with an entire team, Absolutely. right? Where is the industry heading? I mean, is it becoming more, you know, more? is there more tribalism? Is it more, I mean, are there good agencies out there left that, you know? The agency, the, the agency business, advertising agency business is dying. It's dying. It's dying. Okay. Um, but it, people are still advertising. Everyone still, advertises. So where are these, who's creating well, these campaigns? I, I think the, the world is, it's all about computer, it's all about digital. And we're losing respect where, you know, 
we're losing respect at the client level. Hmm. There was a time when I did an ad, the first person I would take to see the ad, I would bring it to the chairman of the board. Right. And he would look at it and talk about it and everything else. And then after years of that went by, you couldn't get in to see the chairman of the board. Right. You couldn't even get in to see the president. You got to see the marketing director. And then <laughs> at the end, you, if you couldn't see the marketing director. You got to see the advertising director. Yep. And there was, there's less respect for advertising now. There's much less respect. And the companies that were great advertising, advertisers, Procter & Gamble, P&G, General Motors, all these, they just, they just get it out there. Whatever it is, they get it out there. Uh, so it, it's a dying business. So what would you tell a wide-eyed kid who comes up to you and says, Mr. Delphamina, I want to go into advertising. What would you tell I me? Mean, besides staying six feet away from me, there's a pandemic going on right now. <laughs> right. What would you tell that enthusiastic kid? Go into finance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. That's stable? Finance? Yeah. You think? Well, it's, you know. It'll told, be around. It's yeah. like, it, it'll be around. People are making money out of money. Sure. Uh, to a kid who wants to do it. And, you know, I have a young man who uh, I just put his name on the door of my agency, Paul Kruger. Young. And he's doing great work. And that's how he got his name on the agency. It's now called Delafamina Farron Kruger. Uh he he's young and he's enthusiastic and he turns out good work, but the ball field is getting smaller. You know, the, the ability to do this work it used to take. We would go to shoot a commercial. We would travel to Europe to shoot a commercial. Now, he's you know, what we do is we look at old footage whatever we could find, and we pick up footage and everything else. I had a guy who decided he wanted to go to Paris, and he did a commercial for me, for a bank. And the whole commercial were these two guys in a car talking, and at one point they passed the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> he said, what, what, what's the Eiffel Tower doing in your commercial? So I want to go to, I want to, go to Paris. Just to let everybody know uh, that you're in Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he went to Paris. Today, everything is really cut down. Uh, so there just aren't the same outlets, you know. Uh, I say that, but I'm still writing and I'm still doing advertising. Right. Uh, but I, I intend to die at my desk. <laughs> uh, uh, the fact is that that uh, I don't think they're reaching young people anymore. Mm. I don't see that many young people saying I want to make it into advertising. Right. But it's all about the computer. I mean, you know what? It's evolution. <laughs> This has been great, Jerry. I know we got to wrap it up. I know you got to get to the plaza tonight. You were voted the right, sexiest man once again. But uh, this has really been an honor. Unfortunately, by this group. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, really been, it's really been an honor. Uh, thank and you. Thank you I've so much it. for sitting down and continued success. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you for listening. All right. I appreciate it. That was advertising legend Jerry Della Femina. If you want to learn more about Jerry and his work, head to DellaNYC.com and visit us at BeautiesAndTheBeastsPodcast.com. Now be sure to join us next time for our conversation with another Madison Avenue legend, John Bond. Co-founder of Kirschenbaum Bond & Partners, one of the most original and irreverent agencies in the industry, known for bringing a big dose of New York attitude. We'll see you then.